It's a pleasure to have you all here for another exciting edition of Stories Behind Products. I am thrilled to share with you the story of Foresight Helmets. Amoya Demibelek, a professor of industrial design at UNSW, and I'm delighted to welcome you all from the beautiful Bijikul country where I live. I pay my respects to the Bijikul people who are the traditional custodians of this unceded land and I acknowledge their elders, both past and present. This evening, we have the super duo, Alfred Boyagdis and Julian Chow as our presenters. Both are exceptional graduates at UNSW with first class honors in industrial design. Alfred and Julian will talk about Foresight Helmets, the world's first ECE approved mass produced high-tech smart motorcycle helmets with integrated communication, navigation, and safety features. Foresight MK1S won the Good Design Australian Best in Class Award in 2022, and Foresight MK1 won the Good Design Awards Australia Gold Award in 2019. Alfred is co-founder and CEO at Foresight Helmet Systems, He's a talented industrial designer with experience working on wearable technology for intellectual ventures in Sydney. His journey started as an intern for Panasonic, consumer electronic engineering in Japan, working on the world's first smart fridges. Alfred was a research assistant at UNSW for a year. He also worked as a structural engineer, graphic designer and assistant on 100 plus different projects for Sandcraft. Julian is the talented co-founder and head of design and UI UX at Foresight Helmet Systems, leading multidisciplinary roles since 2014. His career started in visual communication at Convey in Hong Kong. He has since worked on a range of exciting industrial design projects for Tapi Media, Sabre Design, ATP Sydney, and Indanda in Hong Kong. Julian was also a design studio tutor at UNSW Industrial Design. You can ask your questions via the chat function. Now, it's time for Alfred and Julian to take the stage. Over to you too. Um, so rather than having graphics show up in front of a helmet, which is something that we've built in the past, the LED array that can dull and brighten in those situations is just much easier for people to understand. So we can create uh, an overall user experience um, that's nice when you're traveling at speed. So that's really kind of like what we do at, at Foresight, what the product is. Yeah, it's also quite gestural and you don't you don't have any language barriers. People perceive color in the same way and people also perceive um, the patterns in, in a similar way as well. So that's how we came up with, um, with this. And we'll go into that a little bit later of how we how we eventually came up with that design in um, so, the latest slides. I can explain this slide. Yeah. So, so this slide here is, so we're a Microsoft partner as well. So like on the back end of our system is where a lot of the smarts happen in. So where all the processing happens, it doesn't happen on board the helmet. So um, essentially like to build a product like this, rather than putting all the computing power into the helmet, which makes the helmet quite expensive and not really that intelligent, it's done on the back end in real time. So Every millisecond, we update all of the apps um, that are out there with our riders with new incoming information. This could be um, locations of speed cameras, police cars, potholes on road from like the Waze API. It could be traffic data. Uh, it could be um, reports coming in from other riders that are around there. So there's an element of predictive thinking about the information that's coming in. And that goes into our command system. And we actually have a pattern around or pending pattern around how that information is given to the rider at speed. So based off your bearing, your speed, um, your riding habits, it'll actually tailor that information and give it to you in a timely way. And that's kind of like what protects our company actually the most. It's the, the backend data system um, that it's all built on. Cool, this is the foresight mobile application that we developed, um, provide you with all sorts of uh, controls um, and advanced kind of preferences that you like. So if you want to choose to know more about um, police, for example, if there's any police in the area, if there's car accidents, if there's uh, any sort of traffic and hazards, um, you can 
uh, set your preferences to and tailor that to your writing experience. And you're about to see how ironic the police alert is when you see my final year project. Um, <laughs> so it kind of went up all like to the dark side, but anyway. Yeah, cool. Let's get to the next slide. So we've been featured in quite a lot of um, different sort of publications. Um, and uh, we've won quite a few awards from this project, which is um, great having that kind of recognition. So um, this is where we all began in UNSW Industrial Design. So uh, Alfred, if um, you can explain a bit of how you came. To yeah, so like originally, um, I guess uh, I wanted to make a product for the, for the police force. So that's why it's really kind of ironic that I'm making something that tells motorcyclists where police are. And I guess that it changed that way because we had a whole bunch of motorcycle riders actually um, ask us for the product prior to the, the police force wanting it. So it kind of changed a bit. But, you know, really like the, the design of this project was something really ultra futuristic, um, something very different to everything you had that's out there now. And it's kind of like the concept car to the realized mass produced um, product. So there's still a fair amount of features and principles inside here that go into this product today. So go next slide. So here's a picture of it. And I think the, the major thing and the reason it's called Foresight is it's all about um, getting information to a motorcycle rider in a faster way. So they have some level of precognition. In this situation, it was more about uh, a police officer wearing the helmet, getting to the scene of an accident, being able to broadcast the information with a camera that was under the visor um, to like a local area command or to uh, emergency, so another emergency service like an ambulance and be able to react faster. And the way that changed into the product that it is today is foresight is more about preemptive thinking about road alerts of, it could be a pothole on the road because I had an accident went through that as well. Um, it could be, you know, some sort of hazard or a nearby driver for a real kind of situation that's happening now. So a lot of the principles that happened in this project actually made it into the mass production product as well, just a different customer. And we do have police that own our helmet and use it today as well for similar reasons. So this is the founding of Foresight. So um, Alfred and I actually started off in this warehouse building um, just in Alexandria. So it was a co-working space of sorts and um, it was quite a strange place in fact. And um, we worked out of there and we grew from uh, just two people to six people in that room. And um, this is where we came up with the first uh, consumer product that um, kind of was inspired from from what um, Alfred has done for his project. And um, this is the Foresight Alpine. So it's a snow sports helmet that had um, all the tech features similar to the Foresight um, police helmet. And um, this is more of an entertainment product than a police force helmet. Um, it's got tracking and you go to the ski slopes and be able to share um, your footage from, from that day and be able to listen to music um, around the, the ski slopes as well. So, so once again, why? Um, and the reason is when we took on our first um, investment, the, the ambition to build a motorcycle product actually um, and the money that was required, everyone said, it's impossible. Like you, you, need, you need millions and millions of dollars. Your team isn't good enough, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we kind of listened to those things. We were like, oh, well, what do we do first? And we had a, 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 some investors at the time that were added skiers. Um, they suggested the snow sports product. Now, kind of the first mistake in entrepreneurship is making a product that you don't actually uh, understand or really <laughs> have a huge amount of passion about. But we were really making this so we could make money to make the motorcycle thing. And this is, I guess, where Jay and I's PTSD starts. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, it ends with a new product, but this is where it begins, I guess. So it also featured a, a mobile application at the time. And uh, we already had these like budding ideas of um, how this uh, foresight motorcycle product would work. And so in a similar fashion, we kind of um, added a lot of the features that we wanted um, in, this, in this product. And um, that eventually... Um, grew and also stemmed from from this area. So some of the learnings we had was um, snow spots were a very seasonal um, seasonal thing. So you, you do it once a winter. Um, the price point that we had to build the whole entire helmet was like just way too high for the the targeted market. 
Um, and also the investment and the potential market was quite capped and quite limited for what um, what we could do with that particular product being such a high end and expensive product is it was just very hard to market. So we kind of took a break from that and um, we started doing an OEM model. So we started producing what we called the Eon system. So this system had a couple of like cool features in there and um, we were going around essentially to all the helmet brands to see if um, any of the brands wanted to work with us um, and buy our technology. And um, the offering also included the mobile application and um, uh, a few little uh, interesting bits and pieces for them to integrate into their products. So, so even though this was an excruciating experience for us to go around to all the manufacturers and try to sell a chip, which is against every design principle I know really, but um, the the main thing that we got from, from doing this, we, we were successful in a license, which Jay will show you in a bit, but um, it was actually, we met some of the best people in helmet design while we were there uh, some of the biggest manufacturers and kind of like the capacity of every single company that was out there. So in my little black book, as I was going around, I was taking the names of the heads of design, what factories they were making stuff in. And actually that little black book was really, if I was ever to make my own motorcycle thing um, or my own product in that sector, I'd be talking to these people and this network inside there. So I know if it sounds a little bit kind of... Um, uh, deceitful or cunning or whatever, but that was really actually fundamental in, in the design of our future products. And building that network and knowing all these mm -hmm. people, um, getting to know essentially how the, the industry worked was, was where, where this product actually helped us. So this was one of the first uh, few projects we did. Um, this is an American football helmet um, with all the, the smarts and all the uh, cool things that we had from the Alpine and we integrated it into um, a different helmet. So and that was the finished product yeah, over so here. Essentially, it's an Alpine. It looks kind of like the same thing. It's the same format, same tech. But the license of this technology essentially got us back the capital that we invested in the snow sports product. So we essentially got ourselves back to square one <laughs> with this product and had a lot of fun kind of doing it. And there's, and, um, yeah, this is me... Uh, training with a Seattle, a Seahawks, Seattle yeah. Seahawks. Uh, so this this helmet broadcasted the the plays um, to the ref on the, on the sideline. I know nothing about the NFL, so I was a bit of a fish out of water here, um, talking to people like Russell Wilson and stuff. I didn't know who they were, which was kind of good because I wasn't like fanboying over them. Um, but that was a, yeah, a fun, fun little thing. It was fun, actually. Yeah, so that was a little interim side, side project. Um, so we learned a lot from that. Um, it's just the... The whole business model did not really help us succeed into what we wanted to be. Um, and we were just talking to amongst ourselves and thinking, is this going to be the career we want to? Like we, we were, first of all, trying to steer away from doing more design consultancy work. Um, and however, we still found ourselves back into it. So our licensing is as I said, it goes against everything you are as a kind of a designer, because you're like you're, you're selling a component which they essentially integrate. And you're really just a component salesperson. You get treated as such and you not really, not, don't really listen too much about ideas. And it's in our DNA to build something ourselves. Um, so we kind of had a split in the company at that point with some investors and um, we decided to pursue uh, our own product again. Yeah, so we also discovered that a lot of these manufacturers and factories, they work on a very different margin and work on a very different pricing model um so when that happens you're we're talking about electronics that are hundred dollars but um to them they're working with margins for plastics which cost them 50 cents 20 cents so they were quite scared of um what we were offering and they didn't really understand how to do a lot of these things um or integrating um our technology into into their their products um, so that was quite scary for them and um, we didn't choose to pursue that so one thing is like all the big helmet manufacturers were like you can never get this thing through standards um and turns out we knew a way to do it but um no one else did until this, to this <laughs> day they still don't understand how to do it which is um interesting right. yeah so this kind of stems back to what alfred was mentioning before um, most of these 
uh, modern motorcyclists would be putting all these devices onto their helmets. Uh, they've got cameras, they've got this like massive comm system. And a lot of the times you don't really, you know, have a lot of riders with you. You'll be doing it solo. So you'll be using that comm system to solely listen to music. So um, we found all these click on devices were actually getting phased out um, by the legislation and um, that these products are actually quite dangerous um, if you use these products to modify your helmet. So just for retrospect, like we're at the, the Hero 12 now with GoPro, right? Like when Jay and I were discussing this type of technology, it was the Hero 2, like when it first came out. Comsets weren't even really a thing that had taken off. This kind of, so I guess we were like five years ahead of the curve. <laughs> now, now manufacturers are kind of going like, oh, damn, like we have to integrate this tech now. Yeah, um, and so also to pass the standards and make the actual product safe. So we had that edge already um, to kind of pursue this product. So which at, at that point in time, manufacturers were like, no one puts cameras on their helmets. Why would you want to do that? Like, and, you know, no one sells stuff online. Like that was the kind of vibe that was happening. So, <laughs> yeah, so we, we kind of used that kind of disconnect between um, the brand, the big brands and the actual community. And we found that that we could actually use that to our advantage. And so we started looking at how to position us in this entire market and looking at different brands and um, where we can actually sit in this uh, in this particular marketplace with our product. And so that actually driven us to find what sort of features we, we can in, include within this price point and uh, within this category. So we started to pivot to the motorcycling um, and uh, we pretty much put all our resources to this um, particular project. Um, and we, this led us to our very first uh, motorcycle prototype. And this is actually the UNSW wind tunnel. Um, if you guys have been there, you probably recognize it. Um, so that's how we um, came up with a design of aerodynamic, very simple um, design to trial the product. So if you can see in this uh, prototype, the actual camera and all the um, electronics were actually inside the forehead and also it's spread out throughout the entire shell. Um, so this was uh, one of the, the riders we, we put the helmet on and Alfred came up with this um, pretty interesting idea at the time and we didn't need to know more about the community and what people were actually looking for in in this particular style of product and so alfred went into facebook and started creating a facebook group and also hitting up all these um, different um riding clubs and so one of them was the desmo club in uh, san francisco um alfred do you want to chat about this a little bit yeah yeah look uh when we we're like, oh, we're going to make a, a motorbike product. We set up a Facebook page, went to all these riding groups and they actually joined the group. So um, at one point, like would have been a month after creating the group, we had about three and a half thousand riders, like six there. We had six thousand six months in and ended up getting to about seven and a half, eight thousand riders who were just interested in smart helmet tech. So, you know, what they what we did here was, you know, Jay do some sketches, I do some market research. We kind of and they were almost like the entire riding community was like, if we were a design firm, they were the clients. And in this situation, we kind of like, we changed things and we eventually got to a product, which they're all, they felt they built because we were just doing it as a conduit um, through them. And in San Francisco, I went over there, you know, met with a bunch of people in tech, talked about helmets, um, smart helmet tech and what they thought, piloted this new, this model that we had, which didn't really work. But um, it was kind of like the community was actually, the the main driving force behind the product from the sketch pretty much yeah so obviously there was like a lot of things that were wrong about this um first prototype or first um iteration of this helmet um, we actually learned a lot from this um from from that writing group and so we went back to the drawing board and started um, redesigning the whole thing and uh, one of the learnings was um how do we actually pass the standards to make this a consumer ready product. So we started moving all the electronics away from the forehead area, which is basically the, the very vulnerable area where all the testing happens, all the impacts happen. So we moved it all away to avoid uh, the major crash zones and we put it right in front of a chin bar. So 
We had a few advantages by doing that. Um, and one of the things that we had to um, reinvent was how it was mounted to the carbon fiber shell. So we had to build a, a system to do all that. And this actually, this is called the reflex mechanism. And this mechanism actually helped us um, not only pass the standards, but also um, be able to, for us to easily install and also disassemble the electronics. So maintenance became very easy. And also um, if you've damaged your shell, the customer can easily buy, purchase a new shell and we'll just install the same electronics um, back onto an, a brand new shell. So the post-purchase servicing was became a, a very important um, thing in in our uh, whole entire foresight purchasing experience. So like, for example, you know, 80% uh, of the cost of goods is in the electronics module, the rest is the, the helmet itself. The electronics is the most expensive bit. So if you have an extra small helmet in teal or something and you can't sell it, it sits there for a very long time. So what we do is as people order the helmet, we put the electronics in and if anyone damages the helmet, they can send it back to us and for half the price, we'll um, put it into a new shell for them. So it's that versatility, which is really important from day one. And this is how the, the mechanism works and that allows the actual unit to um, pivot and move independently during a crash. And that allows the carbon fiber shell to do its job and take the impact uh, without cracking. So we started looking at different ways of um, delivering more value to our riders. And um, a lot of people have talked about heads up display, which um, Alfred have um, briefly touched on. Um, we're figuring out what is a very minimalist way to provide information to a rider who's in a very high intensity environment. So we looked at um, Formula One drivers and they have this very similar technology using LEDs and that tells them when to shift and um, how what RPMs they're in. So um, this was a very cool way and we thought that was a um, interesting way of, of doing that um, in the helmet. So a lot of people asked, how do you know when your camera is on or uh, how do I navigate? And we came up with an idea of just using lights to just tell you when your camera is on. And that kind of grew into all these different functions that we discovered we could do with LEDs. And um, we started um, experimenting with um, how to provide navigation information. So turn left, turn right signals. And we came up with a very simple way of doing that, which evolved eventually into um, today's LED system, um, which we call the peripheral display. So using just 16 LEDs, we can provide all sorts of different patterns, colors, um, different sorts of information that we could um, provide to the, the rider without distracting them on the road and be able to see the road quite clearly. So we started looking for all sorts of partners and, and factories that um, we work with, like we went to all sorts of um, countries, went to uh, Vietnam, we went to China, we've, uh, and then we eventually landed in, um, in Taiwan, which um, a, brand, uh, a brand was quite supportive of us. Um, they understood our project quite well, and that evolved us um, into building the first uh, 20 prototypes um, with the technology inside. So this is what it kind of looked like at first. Um, we were just like strapping all this tech onto the helmet and um, it was just a, a messy thing that we did, but that gave us a lot of learnings to um, eventually get to um, a first polish product, which we also called the Founders Edition. So we launched the first thousand units of the Founders Edition. Um, and we did that at a event that we hosted called the Test Fest. So this was in 2019 at Luddenham Raceway um, here in Sydney. Um, we woke up like what 5 a.m. in the morning, um, preparing the helmets and getting everything to to the race course, um, setting up all the stands and getting demos ready. It was well, a hectic experience. The, the night before when we went live, there were so many people trying to buy the helmet that the whole web server crashed. And we had to migrate our entire payment system onto a new gateway. So I was on the phone until four in the morning, set my alarm for 30 minutes, and then got back in the car with all the helmets to head out to the track. 
And there was people there at like six o'clock in the morning bringing us Red Bulls and being like, come on, guys, get through it. Like, get through today. Yeah, we had guys from like Canberra. <laughs> we had people from Brisbane riding down just to to essentially experience um, what, what all this was. Uh, and we had, you know, racer there um, and um, doing all sorts of like cool stuff on track. And yeah, the turnout was, um, was quite amazing. And um, we had so many people come in so to check out what was going on. On that first day, uh, even though I was very sleep deprived, um, you know, I had one of our investors come up and say, you've sold 700 helmets today. And I was like, like, that is insane, right? And the only reason we didn't sell the full thousand that day was we, we did a tour all around Australia and people were waiting just to check their size. So it was a quite an overwhelming success. And I guess like all of these people were in our community and they felt like they built it. So when they came, they were already like vested in the product. And even though it was buggy and it didn't really do everything we said it would, they just, they bought it anyway, right? So yeah. It's, yeah it's this is to Alfred, um, you know, fixing up some of the prototypes and getting it ready for, for customers. Um, we had customers riding on the track um, with the with the prototypes and trying out the features, um, and also providing us with a lot of like handy feedback and um, which uh, helped us to improve the product even further uh, later on down the track. So we actually sold out of the founders edition um, within the first three days. Yep, um, and. Um, that actually won us the first um, Good Design Awards in, in Australia, which um, we're quite proud of. And um, suddenly COVID hit and um, <laughs> we got stranded by, we've got all these orders, we've got all these customers waiting for, for their product. They're super excited about it. And all of a sudden our logistics, our supply chains, they just suddenly crashed and stopped delivering to us essentially. Yeah, so we're on the on the premise of uh, popping champagne. People really like our product. We're like getting ready to ship them out, talking to suppliers. Then this happens, and essentially it like puts the brakes on like the entire operation almost immediately. And so we had a breath of normality right after that, and um, we actually received our products. Um, uh, we're also flying over to to Taipei before. Um, just to like make sure everything was is in check before all the helmets arrived. And um, we finally got them here. We fully assembled everything and we started shipping as fast as we can to to make sure um, there was no hiccups. So, in so these helmets were a year late when we finally received them. So we had to, we couldn't make any more because like we needed these to get out the door first. So we weren't really open to taking even more pre-orders we had to keep the community and all the people that had faith in us online and not wanting a refund. Like we had at least, um, I'd say 10% of the customers get a refund throughout the process for waiting so long. Um, but we were able to resell their build slot to someone else that really wanted one. Um, so it was really an arduous process to get these out and get them out there. And what we were thinking as founders was like, if this is how it all ends, at least let's get these customers their helmet and then ride off into the sunset, so to speak, <laughs> rather than going down as the company that didn't deliver anything. Um, so it was a very momentous day when we shipped those out and a, and a sigh of relief. And before, um, you know, before celebrating COVID-2, kind of happens. So yeah, at that point, it's like, okay, we got them all out. Let's order some <laughs> more helmets so we can start selling them and making making some money. And then, you know, like big brands were buying um, semiconductor kind of like toilet paper at this point in time, um, panicking that, you know, COVID would never end and um, buying enormous like multi-billion dollar surpluses of chips. So this kind of left us in this position where, hey, we want to buy some chips for our helmets, but all the big manufacturers are buying them up. So we had to buy them off a thing called the spot market, which is like, it's kind of like... Um, like the stock market for, for chips, right? And these numbers fluctuate. So essentially what this is, is like uh, a big manufacturer will buy too many chips, then they'll want to sell those chips and companies small like us want to buy them. And then we end up paying anywhere between five and eight times as much to get the chips to sell them. So we were end up making helmets, which cost us just as much to make as much as they retail, right? But the fact was we were still producing and still shipping the product and just kind of surviving by a bootstrap to kind of get it out there and grinding through. And now 
now that we're getting helmets like delivered in a, in a much more rapid way, um, you know, our margins are getting a hell of a lot better. They're actually quite good at the moment. And um, to date, um, we've shipped over 5,000 units. So like, you know, it was a really big effort to get where it was, but. Yeah, we stayed yeah. resilient and um, we just kept going. And it's like, we even like couldn't pay ourselves for uh, quite a long time during COVID um, just to survive through and, and keep the company alive. Um, so after COVID, we're like, we really need to get all these riders. We need to get this community back together. So we we started doing more events uh, and having more of a physical presence. Um, so we started going to places like Pie in the Sky, which is a place where a lot of uh, motorcyclists like to gather um, before their ride or during their ride. And um, that was quite a, a successful event. And um, we started doing more of that and we discovered the power of, um, of events. So I was, I got something to add. Yeah, yeah cool. Uh, so like, this is us selling another three. So we had 300 helmets land. So we were like, hey guys, we got helmets again. Um, pretty much that day we sold 300 helmets. Like, and these people were all coming, like this is like eight o'clock in the morning. Or like, can I buy one? Can I buy one? And I was like, oh, they're all sold. Like I was actually setting up the table for this event. And this guy came, he was the first person to get there. And he's like, I just wanted to try my size and buy a helmet. I'm like, no worries. And I, I went on the on the website to put his um, order through and it wouldn't process the order. And I'm like, I don't know what's going on here. So called up our CTR and I'm like, there's something wrong with the website. I can't put orders through. And he's like, dude, they're all sold. And I'm like, it's, it's been open for an hour. Like how, how is <laughs> that? Awesome. He's like, they're all sold, man. And then these people... Like that whole like meme of shut up and take my money thing happened in real life here where people were like getting angry that they couldn't buy one so much so that this guy rode up from Melbourne and he wanted to buy a helmet and he's like, I'm leaving my helmet here. Here's a thousand dollars cash and I'm taking this one. And he like pretty much picked one up. I'm like, it, it took, a, it took a de demo helmet <laughs> like, and it took it with like, him. Dude, what are you doing? You can't take it. It doesn't have all the stuff. And he's like, look, mate, I'm not leaving without one. And he was like, made a big scene about it. And I was like, fine. I took his cash and I was like, take it, whatever. Um, <laughs> so that's how we discovered like doing events and um, being having this more physical presence was was such an important thing rather than just solely being an online business. So we started sponsoring more races, more riders, um, going to the racetrack more. Uh, this is one of our um, riders from ASPK. So Aiden Hayes is a is a um, a big uh, advocate of our Foresight brand. There he is um, through the racetrack. I'm just going to quickly show you um, a footage from, from Aiden's helmet. Um, switch. So this is just a short clip of um, one of his point of view videos. Yeah, yeah. Let's we'll switch back to that. But like we had, um, so that that was at two hundred kilometers an hour, and um, we we went through actually building these helmets. So racing is really close to us, right? So, you know, I remember the first um, prototypes that we took down to the racetrack. Essentially, like shook apart um, under the stress of racing, and I was in the pits with like screwdrivers and wires and soldering irons trying to fix the helmet like in real time and put it back on the racer and take it out again. And, um, you know, the learnings of that meant that the module that we made was so shock resistant and so resilient, like a regular rider doesn't do these types of speeds and come off like this, right? So it's kind of over-engineered. And, um, you know, like that guy came off uh, at 200 Ks and we were able to take the module out, put it into a brand new shell and reship it to the extent where we had our competitor shark helmets come up to the stand, shake our hand and go like, Welcome to the big leagues, because like if you're not racing, you're not really in the in the sector, right? So that was kind of a big moment for us. So that video, um, just I just showed you, um, that that became quite a a, a big uh, reach inside the community, and and people start to see the the value of having that camera in front of you, you're capturing the moments, and if you can do that on the track, you can do it on the road. So 
um, that became a really big feature for us. And a, a lot of people started um, tuning into what we were all about and what we were actually doing. So we started receiving a big following um, after that video. And so um, through the feedback of our customers and um, also from the community, uh, we were also um, looking at how to improve the product and take this to another level. And um, we received a lot of feedback about um, wind noise, comfort, um, just basic materials, and also um, they want more from the audio because they love the music so much. Um, they wanted more sound quality. They wanted um, more comfort from, from having drivers next to their ears as well. So we, we uh, started redesigning everything and um, we launched the MK1S. So the MK1S uses the same platform as the first helmet and we did a lot of modifications to it and we also redesigned um, the visors and providing them with uh, a uh, essentially a, a leading, um, a world leading brand pin lock, uh, having pin lock inside um, and all these features that people actually wanted um, in the next version. And we also worked with the Harman Audio, which um, provided us with a lot of sound tuning and support with so um, the sound. Pin, pin lock is an anti-fog insert for the visor, for those of you not in the, in the motorcycle the industry. <laughs> Um, and that allowed us, um, for a lot of riders which um, requested this feature, um, that allowed us to redesign and uh, integrate this feature. So that was the premium liner that we um, redesigned. Um, and this is the anti-fog layer, um, which Alfred has mentioned. Um, and we also created a locking mechanism um, for those that, are, that really like to go on the racetrack and, and race. And this is the um, new driver that we worked with um, Harman Kardon um, to pretty much produce a, a new sound experience um, within this helmet and providing a better sound stage um, while you're listening to so, music on the road. So I, I guess like something really interesting here is you, you launched your product and, and your brand out and you, you're pretty much a nobody, right? And then I guess as you start to get traction and ship more product, uh, bigger brands want to start to work with you. And I guess we call this uh, benchmark branding. So because not so many people know what Foresight is, having the Harman Kardon logo, the Sony logo, the Pinlock logo associated with the brand, even a good designer work to an extent, um, helps elevate and for people to understand that this is a trustworthy brand. And I guess as we start to build our next generation products, we'll, we actually are partnering with, with even bigger brands that want to get involved with what we're doing. So it's just something to kind of note, like if you're launching your own product out in the industry, benchmark branding can be a really powerful tool that you don't have to spend a lot of marketing effort on to leverage the network of a larger brand. So, yeah. Cool. And so we started improving uh, the, the mobile application as well. So providing more reliable alerts um, as well as um, being able to, um, edit your videos and be able to share the experiences just like um, what Aiden has done for us um, with, with the point of view videos. Um, and also um, a new feature that we've launched was um, route building, which allows riders to share their itinerary with other riders to um, essentially build out a day of riding um, with other riders and their friends. So that also helped us um, build the community and um, allow people people to hop onto the, the whole entire foresight platform and um in 2022 that this product won us the um good design award i have way too much to drink i'm just gonna be honest <laughs> <laughs> yeah there's there's alfred hiding in the back yeah there. yeah you can tell <laughs> a couple too many yeah. <laughs> that was a fun night um so we we found we discovered the power of um, of community and and also um, sponsoring a lot of events. So uh, one of the big events we sponsor is um, Women's Ride Day as well. So this is one of the big turnouts we had, and um, just having this big community of people and involving them um, in our in our riding and also involving them in our R and D um, that actually has built us a lot of credibility in in the local community. Yeah, interestingly, like when we first started out, only about 5% of our customers were women. Now it's about 20%. So like that that community is growing, uh, definitely through our kind of support these type of days. And this is our customer ride day. So every now and then we'll be 
uh, opening up um, the, the office and we'll get um, new customers and, and also existing customers to come, um, come hang out with us, uh, learn about what we're doing and also go for a ride together. Yeah, I think it's really important. Like you are selling a product, but like if you're selling like a community and an experience as well, it's definitely a lot more powerful. Like these people love knowing about like what's coming up with Foresight, going for a ride, enjoying the motorbike, you know, telling us some feedback about the product. And, you know, we re really like being there and doing this kind of thing. So, yeah. So through learning about um, the last, uh, the first 1,300 units that we, we sold, um, we learned a lot about customer service and learning about how to uh, essentially help them with their aftercare of, of the product. Um, and yeah, a lot of people have been enjoying our, our product and services. And um, we're essentially the only foresight, well, we're the only smart helmet product uh, in the world that you can service and also um, maintain after purchase. Yeah, proud, proud to say that the only real complaints that we've got is like, it's got lost in the mail, which isn't really our fault. Um, or they've bought the wrong size. So, so I think we're doing pretty good on the tech and product side. Cool. And um, we're also quite um, fortunate to have um, Ryan from Fortnite, who is a really big uh, motorcycle influencer on YouTube. And um, he was really interested in our product. And um, he actually purchased the product off us. Um, we didn't even send him one for free or anything like that. Uh, he wanted to buy one voluntarily and uh, he wanted to do a, a honest review of the product. And so, yeah, this guy's got uh, millions of people that follow him. And when he's like, I'm going to buy the product. And I was like, well, well, we can just supply it to you. It's all good. And he's like, no, no, no. Because if it's shitty, I'm going to, I'm going to tell people it is. And I'm like, oh my God. Okay. So when we were making this helmet, we're like, make sure everything is 110% perfect. We, we triple checked it like checked. three sides. We made sure it connected and everything was operating. Um, nothing, you know, nothing scary will happen when he receives it, hopefully. So um, yeah, that was, that was a an order that we paid a lot of attention to. So he was like, it's brilliant. It's it's the best smart helmet thing that is out there. It's actually the only thing you could buy. And you can see like our web traffic on that day went to 11,000 people in the USA talking about it. And this spurred um, the interest of a quite a large, which We've got a bit quite a large distributor in the United States. Yeah, so last year we also uh, launched um, in ICMA. So this is a, one of the biggest um, motorcycle shows in Milan. Um, it was a four day event and we spoke to a lot of, um, you know, industry um, people and also a lot of uh, customers who were walking around and it was roughly around like 11,000 people per day in foot traffic. Um, and it was like all these huge brands and suppliers that we met. Um, it was a very um, interesting and successful show. So um, we also recently launched in the US um, over in the USA version of ICMA. So the AIM Expo is um, another motorcycle show over there. And we had um, loads of interest and um, we also established a distribution network and this network will provide us um, with up to 7,000 stores um, worth of, um, worth of um, inventory and sales. So we're also going to uh, open up direct to customer as well um, in the US um, through this um, help of this distributor. So we've also established um, our Sydney headquarters and assembly. This is where we do all our R&D um, as well as um, final assembly, pickbacking, and also um, shipping to customers. And we also currently have a Taiwanese assembly plant, um, which will aid the uh, supply chain to um, the US orders, um, as well as increasing our production capabilities. Might add here that our, our workers don't wear hoodies and use collapse, collapsible tables. This is when we were just starting it up. <laughs> it's, it's a full-on facility now. <laughs> yeah, next slide, next slide. Quick. <laughs> yeah. So um, Foresight Labs, so you want to talk about this one? Yeah, so with the help of um, New South Wales government, um, this 900 square metre um, facility has been built for us. Um, and this will be unveiled I guess in the next couple of months um, at a ceremony, but this facility is going to be right on the racetrack. It can house up to a hundred people uh, there and have production capabilities. So, you know, really solidifying um, us as an Australian uh, 
company and um, you know producer of this helmet and this will be our flagship area so being able to take riders around the track do more testing um, with racing which is really close to us and pretty much built on a racetrack so um, kind of living the dream yeah and um yeah we hope to make this place a motorsports destination and um really establish our our brand further um in this um, new space that we are being provided so yeah it's going to be exciting and i think that that's about it which leaves us perfectly with 10 minutes to do questions and answers perfect timing Thank you. Such a great story showing the power of community and collaboration and also persistence and trusting yourselves. So there's a few questions in the chat and I'm going to read them. Uh, first question comes from Jackson Jones. He says the handlebar mounted controller is unique in helmet comm systems. What was the, the thought behind the design? Um, so essentially, while you're riding, it's quite hard to operate some of these controls. Um, if you have, even if you have your phone in front of you, you would want something that's quite easy to press on with gloves on. So having a small puck that gives you access to all these um, these basic and also fundamental um, controls um, is is quite uh, useful for for a rider. And um, being able to like switch music, for example, and be able to turn on and off your camera. Um, it's kind of like having a, a shortcut um, towards like, all these features that you have within this helmet. The next question again from Jackson. He says, how difficult was it to design a helmet meeting ECE and DOT requirements with all the internal, internal technology included and with all the ECE 2206 version be developed? Yeah, good question. So we're the only manufacturer with the standard certification because of that special mechanism which we put in there that can absorb the impact for 2205 so it's like this little this little guy here but also the the internals um there's a ceramic battery so having something that doesn't rupture or ignite is very important inside the helmet but we essentially went through hundreds of different prototypes that that failed and, and came to a couple of really core assumptions the first one is you can't rigidly mount the electronics in a helmet because it'll crack um, the shell and you can't put anything into the external foam layer um, because you end up creating um, structural points. So there is brands that do do that. I won't go down a rabbit hole of how they do that, but it's not in a way that they can create a helmet that is super lightweight, um, but also something that is kind of versatile to, to use in a way in manufacture. So we're the only ones kind of doing it that way, this, this special way. Yeah, so we worked yeah. quite closely with um, factories and labs to essentially get enough of that testing data, um, which also gave us um, the information to design the electronics in a very specific area, and which is how we led to our design. So ECE 2206 has a quite a abrupt um, oblique anvil test onto the side of the helmet. So the real change with the two standards is the ECE 2206 is a much higher velocity. So helmets are getting you know bigger because of uh, ECE 2206. Um, we've passed eternal testing of ECE 2206. And the main reason for that is we don't have any electronics inside the phone. It's all in this module at the front. So manufacturers that are integrating 2206 with electronics in the side shell, you're going to have really quite heavy, chunky helmets um, to do that. We don't want that experience for people. Um, I guess like, you know, the standards are very, very close to what we do. And I think that as we evolve the technology, we'll even be creating our own standard for, for smart helmets through electromagnetic fields, types of connectivity to bikes for advanced rider assistance systems, um, types of batteries that you should use. So really we're on the forefront of standards, talking with standards, what is about this now? So yeah, great question. <laughs> great answer. So again, from Jackson Jones, the question is, what type of riders are you targeting? I presume sports bike riders are the major audience. Yeah, do you want to? Yeah, sure. Um, so um, right now, one of the biggest markets is the sport consumer. So the sport consumer is kind of like the your daily sports bike and urban riders. Um, so we've designed it in a way where it's not a very aggressive in a very aggressive riding position so it's quite quite in a neutral spot where it's just between a sports bike and just between a upright naked bike so that kind of helps us capture um, most of these uh, these riders 
Um, in the future, we'll start branching out into um, all sorts of different writing types. So you've got your adventurers, um, you've also got your retro writers, um, which we can have a lot of fun with um, in terms of design. Um, the, the lid itself is quite an important, um, important component of, of the whole, um, whole entire system. Um, we can actually package up the, the electronics um, into different shells um, to provide uh, different use cases in yeah, the future. So, so think about the helmet like um, your, your phone case, right? And the technology like your phone. So that's essentially how we built it. So if we're doing different styles, doesn't necessarily mean that we need an entirely new electronics package. That's that's the foresight experience with the app and the tech. The style is really a fashion, well, it's kind of like a fashion piece for what, for what industry that you're going into with that sector. So we plan to have a bit of everything, yeah, for sure. Anything else from Jackson Jones? Or is there... <laughs> Maybe later on. The next, <laughs> the next question is from Tatyun. And he asks, um, as entrepreneurial designers, what subjects slash topics would be useful to study slash wished you had studied alongside IDES that would help prepare you for running your own business? I'm what do you think it takes, voice. sorry, to be <laughs> successful as an entrepreneur? None. Oh. <laughs> None. It's doing business. Nothing helps you more than getting out there and going and doing it yourself, listening to people and actually building stuff. I'm, I'm sorry. There, I know there's entrepreneurship classes and all of this, and they, they can give you the foundations, like how to do a pitch deck, how to do this, how to make a forecast, how to, like you can do an MBA, right? But what really teaches you is literally just having to do it, right? And getting out there and not knowing and surrounding yourself with a network of people that can help you do it. I'm really sorry, but like... It's kind, of, it's kind of like learning like a martial art, right? You can read <laughs> all about martial arts, but you have to actually get yourself into a dojo and actually try it out um, or else you'll never really know what martial arts is all about. Yeah. I love the analogy with martial arts. <laughs> so true. So the next question is from Professor Islam Air, and she asks if you have any patents on this product. Uh, yes, uh, we sure do. So one of the patents is... Um... So we have so we have two, so we're going to be really comp yep. complex with yep. this. They're all pending patents and they're in different phases and they're in two patent families. We've well, been pulled yeah. up on this before. Um, but yeah, there's a, a PCT patent around the reflex mechanism uh, inside the helmet. The LED array system is actually moving into a standard patent phase, which covers all United States, Europe, Japan and Australia and New Zealand. Um, and it's around the LED array technology. There's a pending pattern at the moment around how the actual helmet receives information um, as far as, so it's like a, a process like a system, pattern, yeah, system, system pattern, pattern yeah. uh, around the back end and how we actually process and get that through. But I guess like one of the, the main things to think about with patents is um, they're kind of only really worth what you can defend with them, like in court, if you get into a battle with a big brand. Um, yeah, they're great to, to kind of have, but if you don't have the steam to fight with them, they they can be pretty useless. So the way that we think about our IP is in two parts. It's like we want to protect the stuff to deter competitors from trying to copy us or, you know, potentially want to buy the technology versus rip it off from us. Um, it gives a lot of satisfaction to the customer to know that those things are unique um, to this product and they're protected. But really it's about speed and brand. Like you got to get those things yep. and capturing yeah. your audience as well as maintaining them mm -hmm. on, on your platform. So you have to incentivize your existing customers and also new customers to stay on your platform and keep using your features. And that's what kind of brings value to our product in particular. Yep. So the next question is from Jackson Jones and he asks is the use of a carbon fiber shell to counteract the weight of the tech yeah he's got the right idea um so we chose a carbon fiber shell um one not only because it's aesthetically really cool and really good looking um it also puts us in a premium category for helmets um as well as um taking away some of the weight um and um allowing us to install the electronics in there to kind of balance out and maintain a good weight category um, 
within within that range of um, helmets, I guess. So the mo the module is only 120 grams. So we've really fought to kind of keep it, even though it does look large. It's actually really light. So we can't create a helmet that has an entirely new weight category because it just won't pass the standards. So like on our biggest size, we're 1550, I think maybe 1550, 1600, depending if you get the premium padding option or not. Mm -hmm. And that's not a new pro that's not a new weight category for the helmet. So when people pick it up, they're like, actually, no, like this is fine. Like it doesn't bubble or anything. And if you try one, you can really see that's like you don't even notice that the tech is there. Put a go, I mean put an action camera, I can't say that that word, um, or a comm set on your helmet, it's way heavier than having one of these. Jackson Jones again. Uh, what has been the consumer's reaction in the UK and US? Uh, so United States, um, customers have been kind of like, you know, this is a pretty amazing technology. I don't have to have these things on the helmet. So much so that almost 100 dealerships have signed up to, to sell it. Um, we're really just struggling to keep up with the demand to ship them over there. Uh, UK, we haven't really done a huge amount of marketing there. We've set, sold about 27 helmets there online. Um, interesting about the UK is you don't have to pay VAT on shipping uh, motorcycle helmets there. So if you ever do want to sell them, UK is not a bad place. But yeah, so USA has been great so far. I think something I can you know, uh, talk about in, in all, all of the markets is the fact that people want to have a, a physical presence to try on, to touch the helmet, to put on their heads, to see how they look, um, to try out the app in person. Um, that's been quite a powerful thing that we've done through events and all these community rides and, and people being able to touch and feel the, the physical thing is, is a, is a really big one. So that's what we're trying to establish in all these markets uh, at the moment. And we're trying to do this in a, in a structured and um, in, in a way where it's, it's, it's step-by-step step to slowly reach all these different markets. And the next question is from Xinhei Wong, and it's how's, how does the mapping guidelines from Formula One translate to daily drivers UI? Do you guys have to refine F1 inspired UI much? Um, it's not so directly a Formula One technology. It's it's more the, the idea of having the lights on the steering wheel and having those positioned in a um, very accessible and easy to see um, area. And at the same time, not obstructing um, the viewport is, is where we got um, some of those ideas from. Um, and it's essentially just being inspired by that, um, that steering wheel light, which expanded us into all sorts of um, interesting features and that became um, different sort of alerts and different sort of patterns that um, we we invented um, from that that strip of LED. The next question is from Ji Meng and she says great presentation Alfred and Julian thank you. I have a question of how do you address technophobia in your design process? Since the helmet is in close proximity to the user's brain, users may have preconceptions or, or resistance when using, using it. Have you encountered this issue? And so how have you addressed it? If so, I hope your products continue to improve in the future. It's amazing. So pretty much like it's really tailored to, to the experience that you want to get out of the helmet. Like you don't have to have every single alert on. You don't even have to have the camera on. You don't even have to have the music on, right? So like when I ride to, to work, I set it on auto record. I turn the helmet on. It just records video for me and I listen to some music while I'm in traffic and stuff. That's, that's how I use my helmet. Now, other people might go, hey, I'm not really interested in the camera, but I do want to go out on the big highway and use it for navigation only. Or there might be people that like, I just want to know about potholes. So it really depends on what you want. But, you know, most of the time, like 90% of the time, the helmet isn't really doing anything unless you ask it to, right? So it's really the convenience of using that technology, like versus click on things on your helmet. Mm. It's a lot easier and more succinct. So kind of imagine it kind of like your co-pilot and it kind of pops up when 
it needs your attention. So let's say um, like what Alfred just said, oh, look, there's there's some sort of like road alert or some sort of um, uh, scary thing that's coming your way. Hey, watch out. Um, or, hey, don't miss this turn. Um, and it's just, they're just constant reminders, but done very subtly and not obtrusive and still allowing you to enjoy that offline experience, if that makes sense. Great answer. The next question is from uh, Xinghei Wang, and it's how does sound translate inside? How how is the balance between the music and noise pass through the outside for awareness? Now oh, this is a good one. So um, most of this is done through passive can uh, noise cancellation. So it's not done with anything that's active. So let's say like some of the like headphones you see out there that have. Um, a lot of like noise cancelling technology, we use um, something more passive. So it's a lot of uh, cushioning and all of isolation uh, within the neckline, which is why we actually redesigned the padding to provide a bit more um, passive isolation. So you can have a better uh, sound environment for the, the drivers to perform. And I might add here that you can never really like seal a helmet completely and make it perfectly quiet when you're on the road. For example, like if you want to hear the outside world Crystal, just open your visor for a second. You'll, you'll hear everything. All the sound will come in, right? And being a carbon fiber helmet, we intentionally, even though we do have some customers that want something really, really, really quiet, that's not the customer we're after. It's one that wants a blend of both, being able to listen to music and also hear the road. So we've done that mechanically versus using technology, which I think is the more reliable way. Mm. Yeah. And not to mention the, the power hungriness of, of active noise cancelling um, and being power being such a sensitive thing um, on this small product. And there's a comment from Justin Alfred. He says, I'm riveted to the screen. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to buy one, <laughs> I'm sure let us know. <laughs> yeah, give me a good price, mate. <laughs> Next question is from Nicholas Fabian. And he says, hi, Alfred and Julian. Thank you for coming on to talk to us. Very informative and interesting. It's clear that market and user research is a large part of your design process and success. Is that a practice that competitors simply avoid? Oh, and yeah, absolutely. So question. like, um, sorry to any big competitor watching us, but um, you kind of suck in this regard. But like when they talk about the end customer, they're talking about the distributor. Right. And this is something we learned when we went to big trade shows. And it's just like, oh, they don't say, like when we talk about a function, we're like, people will like this or people won't like this. This is how we talk about it, right? We're talking about people, the end, people that use our product. Um, but really the disconnect is they want to make better margins, more colors, more colors every year, more, more colors, right? And more variation, right? But when we create a product, we're making it almost selfishly for ourselves because we're both motorcycle riders and we want to use it. And there's a whole bunch of people that want to use it as well. So we see the distributor as kind of like a, a conduit, not really the end customer. And it's easy to get lost in that process because they're the ones paying your bills. So I guess that if you're designing a product, really keep the, the end people, I hate saying users, but people that use your product um, close to the process. Yeah, because end of the day, these factories, they don't really see or meet any of the, the customers that are buying their products. Um, it's usually the stores that are selling the product to the people who have that first point of engagement with, with the customers. And through that, like you, you actually lose a lot of that, um, that value and, and um, learning about what people actually want rather than just a new model, a new color. And uh, one for you, Oya, is if you see a student saying uh, end user or referring to people as end user, you've got to bring them up on it now. Okay, like, well. <laughs> end person, who's that person? Who's the people? How do they use it? People. It's like it dehumanizes the whole process of, yep. of making stuff. Yeah. I don't right. know. So, Nicholas, the second question is, uh, is there anything you would do differently? Awesome to hear about the tech and journey. Congrats. I, I don't have three hours to go through all the things that I do differently. <laughs> in hindsight, everything's 2020, but in, in, in foresight, it's just have a go, right? Yeah. Um, but I guess the big ones are like, you're going to get a lot of advice from a lot of people who maybe haven't built their own company before, or, um, you know, they have their two cents and it's, it's really like you're, you're out there and you're budding and you're learning, but 
I guess it's that kind of arrogance of wanting to do your own thing and do it your way. And what's really unique to the entrepreneur is actually the vision that, that you have. And to keep that um, and keep powering through that and what you believe in is really, really important. So, you know, the biggest mistakes that we made, made were actually just pivoting away from what we actually really wanted to build, right? Um, and being passionate about it because when things get hard and you're like, how the hell am I going to do this? You have to be really passionate about what you're doing and, and why you're doing it. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to do it, right? And being an entrepreneur, you open up yourself to so much noise and, and opinions and how people see what you do or they simply just don't believe in how you do it or what you are trying to achieve. They just and and you just got to give yourself a lot more of that self motivation, and you you just got to keep trying every single time you fail. Um, and which is what I think Alfred and I have given each other is is the fact that we just we just kept supporting each other throughout, and we we never said quit on it. And a big one, a big one, which a lot of designers kind of get wrong, I guess, is um, uh, Woody Allen said a quote called uh, "finished not perfect." Um, so like everyone wants to be the Steve Jobs, Jonathan Ives, I want to make the perfect product, but, but most of the time you either don't have the money to make it perfect, or you essentially, um, don't have the time to kind of make it perfect and you have to get out to market and the things that actually make your product perfect is actually the customer telling you the things that they want. So like, there's only so much stuff as a designer that you can consider without just Kind of yeah. chucking it out there and seeing what happens. The customer will tell you, like I tell you, within one hour what they don't like about the product and what they want. Right? And, and so, everyone's <laughs> version of perfect is going to be different. different. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. different. So um, finish not perfect. Just get it out there, see what happens, then yeah. refine, refine, yeah. refine, refine. It's like everybody wants the world inside the helmet, but um, you can only provide so much because by the end of the time you you have all these features that they wanted. They're like, oh, sorry, it's too expensive. I, I, don't, I can't afford it. It's like this, there's another sale like, uh, which was um, why, does, um, why does someone buy a drill, right? And they're like, for the speed, for this, for the, to do this, et cetera. The, the main reason is to make a hole. So like- <laughs> You're buying the hole. <laughs> so you're buying to make a hole. Like, yeah. So just think about that when you design stuff. Great answers. So I think I'm mindful about the time. And there's a, quite a few more questions. So I think we will end there and we will answer the questions via LinkedIn. So yeah. I'll just, uh, I'll have to wrap up. Thank you so much, Alfred and Julian, for this fantastic presentation and for sharing your story with us and your insight and all your wisdom. It was a pleasure to have you both here today. And also I would like to express my gratitude to everyone who attended this evening, making it even more unforgettable with great questions. And finally, I'd like to announce the next uh, stories behind products. Uh, it will be in July the 3rd, and we will have Ian Beryl, another amazing alum of the UNSW Industrial Design Program. And he will talk about Hexlock system, an ingenious and simple way to secure a bicycle without the need for heavy and cumbersome locks and chains. So stay tuned for the invitation for this event, and we look forward to seeing you again for the following stories behind products. Stay safe and well until then, and look for the answers on LinkedIn for the next questions that we couldn't cover this evening. Stay safe and well, and goodbye, everyone. And thanks again, Alfred and Julian. No thanks, Oya. Bye.